made it uh, out of the Gospel of Matthew in our New Testament reading. We're into Mark uh, this week. If you have not gotten started yet or you've gotten behind, this is a great time to jump back in, just jump into the book of Mark. We've just got through, I think, the first two chapters of Mark. We'll start chapter three tomorrow. Um, let's take a minute and uh, look at our memory verse for this month. It's from Mark chapter 9 and verse 31. Do we have that that we can put up uh, on the screens? Because I'm not sure we have got that learned yet. It says, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, come on, say it if you know it with me, for he's teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be handed over <laughs> okay, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and what are they going to do? And they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. All right. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And let me give you a little hint that helps me a lot. If you'll, when you're learning a verse, uh, it's easiest to learn it a phrase at a time. If you look at the punctuation, specifically the commas, that's good places to divide the verse up and just learn a phrase at a time. I think the first comma would probably be, uh, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them. There's probably a comma right there. So you could just spend, let's say you're starting this passage tomorrow morning, you could spend the first few minutes of Monday morning as you're driving to work, whatever, and just keep rehearsing. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them. And once you've got that phrase down, you add the next phrase to that, and you just keep adding a phrase at a time, and it's a much simpler way to, uh, to get through that verse. Well, that's our verse for the month, so you've got more time um, for that. All right, Mark's gospel um, is about a third shorter than Matthew's. You notice that Mark did not begin with the account of Jesus' birth as Matthew and Luke do, but he jumped right in. Uh, and talking about the forerunner, the, the messenger, John, the prophecy of John. And you're going to see, um, as we go through Mark, some similar narrative to the other Gospels, but probably not as extensive. For example, you notice this week in your reading um, that Mark, when he talks about the temptation of the wilderness, he doesn't give any specific detail. He simply says, Jesus was in the desert being tempted by Satan. Now, remember that each of the, of the Gospel writers has a different perspective and each has a different emphasis that the Holy Spirit impressed them to put down. The Holy Spirit is the one who told them um, what to record in the Gospels. So the Gospels, as we read through, the Gospels are not uh, contradictory, but they're, they're complementary. If you and I saw the same event from two different angles or two different perspectives, it might initially sound like um, our reports are contradictory, but when combined those reports become complementary, and, and we see a more full picture of what actually happened. All right, we're going to jump in in Mark chapter 1. We're jumping in in the middle uh, of a day of ministry in the life of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Verse 29, and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. He came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed." And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and when they found him, said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. All right, so what we've just read is, is the second half of the day. Right before verse 29, you see that Jesus was in the synagogue. Why? Because it was the Sabbath. Jesus was there. He was teaching uh, a man presents with a uh, demon, and Jesus casts that demon out of the man right there in the synagogue. What did that reveal? That revealed that Jesus has authority over the spiritual realm as he commanded that demon to come out. Why is that important to us? Well, it's good for us to know that Jesus' power over the spiritual realm assures us that he can rescue us from sin and eternal death. 
We know he had complete power over the spiritual realm and specifically uh, over Satan. But I'd also remind you that his powers, we see the miracles he performs in casting out demons and and in healing those who are uh, physically ill, his power in the physical realm assures us that the effects uh, of the curse on our physical bodies is going to be reversed and we're going to receive new and glorious bodies. Thank God those of us who are older are not going to look like this in eternity, right? I was talking about me, wasn't looking at any of you. So they, <clears throat> they're at the synagogue, they leave the synagogue, they head to the home of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. This is Simon, Peter, and Andrew's home. James and John are just with them. They're, they're going home after church that morning. And we read there that Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Now let me pause and mention a couple of things that are not mentioned here in the text, but a couple of things you need to know about Peter, and specifically Peter following Jesus. Peter was married. A lot of people don't think about that unless you run across a passage like this where it talks about his mother-in-law. And I think a lot of times when we see that in Mark 4.19, that when Jesus, excuse me, Matthew 4.19, when Jesus called the disciples, immediately they left their nets and followed him. When we see that he immediately followed Jesus, we don't consider the full level of sacrifice. It wasn't just that he left his father um, there with the fishing business and went. He also left his wife and perhaps children to follow Jesus. Now, when I say he left his wife, I don't mean he divorced her and left her. For a time, he was away. He was with Jesus. He was still married. And for example, in this passage, we see that he is coming and, and he's back home. But he had to sacrifice a lot of his family in order to follow Jesus. The second thing is this. Capernaum was the largest city on the Sea of Galilee, and it was a huge uh, place for fishing. Capernaum was also in the center of the trade routes, north and south and east and west. So a lot of commerce went on there. And I say that to say that the fishing business that that Peter and Andrew, that his family were involved in, was no small venture. It was a very um, profitable, very sophisticated business. And so their home, where it says that they were going to his home, their home was no shack. Uh, some of you, in the next uh, couple of months in April, you're going to have opportunity to see the ruins of this home. It was quite a place. It was a huge compound, a huge walled-in compound, had one big uh, entryway or gate or door, and once you entered there, there's a big courtyard with basically um, apartments all around it, several kitchens, and all the family lived on this big compound. And I mentioned that just to say Peter wasn't a guy with just a a rod and a hook. He sacrificed a lot to follow Jesus and to go with Jesus. So they go home after services, and when they get there, um, they ask Jesus, hey, by the way, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, she has a fever. Can you do something? Now, a lot of you would think it was pretty cool if Jesus would do something about your mother-in-law. There's several mother-in-law jokes I could make here, but I'm in deep right now. I'm, I'm going to get out. Um, we've seen before that Jesus is sovereign. He has control of the spiritual world. He has control of the physical world. So it says very simply, he took her by the hand and the fever left her. And look at this. She began to serve them. She made Sunday lunch or Sabbath lunch. Now, if you've ever had a fever, even for a day or two, if you've ever had a fever, you know that it drains you. This woman was very sick. Luke actually says that it was a high fever. She was very sick. They were, they were concerned about her. But look, when Jesus healed her, she didn't need time to recover. The fever was gone. The symptoms were gone. The weakness was gone. She was completely, fully, miraculously healed in an instant. She got up and began to serve them. Well, we read that that triggered quite a response. Word spread around that city. Again, it's a large city. And at sunset. Why sunset? Because it was the Sabbath. They couldn't do work on the Sabbath. They couldn't carry someone to a doctor. But at sunset, literally the whole town, when it says the whole town, it means the whole town, was at the door with the sick and the demon-possessed. Now, can you imagine? You've been to church. <clears throat> you've preached a message. You've interacted with people. You, you've gone home and spent the afternoon with some of your disciples. You've healed the woman of the house. You've had a busy, full, long day, and then you hear some noise, and you go to the door, and you look out, and standing outside the house is this sea of people, demon-possessed, 
and people with all kinds of physical diseases and ailments. I imagine Jesus was pretty tired after a day like this, and yet he healed, Scripture says he healed all those who were gathered there. Now, let's, let's stop on the healing for just a minute. Let me remind you the purpose of the healing. When Jesus healed, the purpose of the healing, yes, it was to demonstrate the compassion of God for people, but the primary purpose of the healing was to authenticate him and to authenticate the message of the gospel. In Matthew 10, when Jesus sends out the disciples, and then in Luke 10, when he sends out the 72, he gives them the authority to heal. He gives them the authority to cast out evil spirits. Why? To authenticate the message of the gospel. You see, the scriptures were not yet written. You didn't know when they would share these words and share what they claimed was the gospel, you didn't know if it was the true gospel or not, but the message was backed up by the miracles. And so the healing was not necessarily to provide health, it was to affirm the gospel and to affirm the true Messiah. You see, today, if, if we want to know if someone is preaching the true gospel, we've got the scriptures. We can listen to what someone's saying compared to the scriptures. And I would challenge you, many of you listen to various preachers on the radio or on television, you always need to authenticate what you're hearing taught. Well, they didn't have the scriptures to authenticate what was being taught, so it was the, the miracles that authenticated the message of the gospel. And you know, there are a lot of people that need healing today. Many of them are right, right here in our body. Christ's followers are not spared disease, we're not spared pain, we're not spared the suffering that exists in our world because of the result of sin. And, and I would warn you today, if you're one of those in need of healing, to be very careful of some of those who proclaim um, the gift of healing, the, the modern-day faith healers. They're con artists. They love to make money off the desperate. If you'll just send me some money, I'm going to pray for you, and God's going to give you a healing. But it's, it's all a sham. It's not about glorifying God. It's about glorifying them, and it's about them furthering themselves. Let me tell you something. If the, if the people who claim to be faith healers were truly faith healers, how come you never see them come to a city like, say, Little Rock, and go through all the hospitals and empty the hospitals out? How come they only do that on television, where they can manipulate circumstances, where they can get a lot of fame? If the people who claim to be faith healers today are truly faith healers, how come they don't come to a city like Little Rock and go to the office of every oncologist and put them out of business? Only God can heal. Sometimes he does, sometimes not. We need to remember that God is far more concerned with our spiritual healing than our physical healing. And there may be other plans that he has for us if we have an illness or a, or a disease. There may be some other ways that he plans to use our sickness to bring him glory and advance the gospel. Listen, if God healed uh, everyone, or at least all Christians, we would have no need for faith. And we certainly would not look forward to the day that we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. It's, it's amazing how we hang on to and cling to this life when it's not real life. Back to the text. All that we've covered so far from the preaching in the synagogue to the casting out the demon, uh, healing Peter's mother-in-law, then basically through the night healing the crowds, the, the whole town, all of that happened in one day. And a day like that was not an anomaly for Jesus. Jesus had constant uh, demands on him that are far greater than anything that has ever been asked of any of us. And remember, yes, he's God, but he's living and operating in a human body. He got very, very tired. In fact, in your reading this week, you're going to see in Mark 6 that Jesus and the disciples were so busy they didn't even have time to eat a meal in peace. In Mark 7, Jesus went away about 35 miles away from where he is at this point, goes away to Tyre and Sidon uh, to a house, I guess a friend, to try to hide out just to get a break from the press of people. But of course, they find him there as well. There, there's no telling after healing all these people who showed up at the door, there's no telling what time Jesus finally got to bed. And, and he probably needed the sleep, and it probably would have been good for him to sleep in a little bit the next morning. But look at verse 35. Verse 35 says that he rose early, before the dawn. 
and he went to a desolate place, a place of complete solitude. And what was he doing? He, he was praying there. If we had time this morning to quickly peruse through all four Gospels, you'd find that Jesus often was up early or up late praying. The more that he was pressed and the greater the need, no matter how tired he was, he prayed. And and you don't see him having quick, abbreviated conversations with the Father. When he prayed, he spent significant time. Often you'll see in in the Scriptures he spent all night in prayer. And it's tempting to gloss over that and say, well, sure, he's God. God can stay up all night. No, he was in a human body. Had the same limitations that that you and I have in our human bodies. Prayer is continual in Jesus' life. It's not casual. It's not brief. It's not sporadic. Prayers that are brief and casual and sporadic produce very little. Jesus spent a significant amount of time in prayer. Because of that, he stayed on course. Because of that, he had a full understanding of the Father's will because he spent that intense, prolonged time in prayer. So he's gotten up early, and he's out, and and he's praying. And verse 36 says the disciples, Simon Peter, of course, in the lead, came looking for him. Now, i got to tell you, when they found him there, they were a little bit dismayed and not understanding what his problem was. They basically said to him, hey, Jesus, what are you doing? There's a whole lot of people back here. There's a whole lot more to be done. Listen, man, do you recognize that you're becoming very, very popular? you got to be with the populace. you got to be with the people. You can't be out here hiding out. They were disappointed with him. Couldn't understand what he was up to. And does he go back to Capernaum to heal more of the crowd that's gathered there? No, in verse 38, he basically says, let's move on. Why? Because I came to preach the gospel. Again, the healing and the miracles were not the priority. It was the preaching of the message of the gospel. Now, Jesus isn't teaching directly about prayer here, but there's certainly a great lesson for us as we look at the time that he spent in, in prayer. We, we know as his disciples we're supposed to pray. We know it's essential for our growth and, and for our, our maturity and for the work that God wants us to do. We know, at least intellectually, looking at Scripture, that p- prayer is both powerful and vital, but we can't seem to fit it into our busy lives. There's always something else to be done. There's so much to do that there's no time to pray. Stop and think about that for just a minute. There's so much to do that there's no time to pray. That's kind of backwards, isn't it? The more we have to do, the more we need the connection in prayer. Martin Luther would often be heard saying, I have so much to do today, I need to spend even more time in prayer. We get busy and we chunk prayer when that's the very thing we need for all the challenges that are facing us. You know, if we spent more time in prayer before we made a decision, before we confronted problems, before we got into temptation, if we spent more time in prayer on the front end, we'd have to spend a lot less time in prayer pleading for deliverance from the trouble we got into because we didn't pray. Prayer is never going to be convenient. It's going to require self-discipline and sacrifice. It's hard work. But let's, let's this morning ask the question, how do we follow the example of Jesus, and how do we fit prayer into our busy lives? And on, on the back of your bulletin, in the, in the place where, if you take notes, the place that's got space for message notes, there are seven quick principles I want to cover with you this morning. There are a couple of spots that you'll need to fill in, but seven quick principles for fitting prayer uh, into our busy life. Principle number one, look at your budget. Look at your budget. You know, if you looked at someone's budget or looked at their checkbook, you'd have a pretty good idea of what's important to them. And someone has said that a budget is a theological document because it tells us what we worship. So when I say look at your budget, I'm talking about your time budget. We all have the same amount of time. We all, all to a degree, waste time. What, What would happen... This next week, and maybe you've had to do this at work on occasion, what would happen if you kept a time log? What would it look like that you had invested your your time and your life in? The reason we don't spend adequate time in prayer is that we don't make prayer a priority. You know the word priority, when it came into the English language in the 1400s, the word priority had a very, very simple definition, and the word priority meant the very first thing. That's it. 
the very first thing. But somewhere along the way, the word priority has become a, 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 a plural, has taken on a plural form, and we talk about not our priority, but our priorities in life. Well, there can't be several very first things. There can only be one very first thing. And prayer should be the one very first thing. And the question we need to ask as we look at the time and the way we, we spend our time is, is my relation with Jesus a priority? Is it the very first thing? Is it the thing that gets crowded out because of all the other things, or is it the thing that takes precedence as priority and maybe something else um, has to get crowded out? Last week, we looked at the parable of the talents, and we talked about, about stewardship. Our time is like our money. It doesn't belong to us. We don't earn it. We can't add to it. We can't make more of it. It's given by God for us to use. So what are we doing with our time, how are we using our time in a way that pleases God? It starts with making prayer our priority. Number two, principle number two, be intentional, not accidental. An accident happens without planning or because of unforeseen circumstances. A child reaches for something and spills a glass of milk. A driver reaches over to adjust the volume on the radio and runs a red light. A, a, a pastor gets caught up in his sermon and loses track of time. Those are all accidents. <laughs> Incidents are planned and calculated and done intentionally. What am I saying here? We need to stop having an accidental prayer life. An accidental prayer life is one that usually um, gets, gets results from crisis. That's what causes us to kick it in and do something about it. Look at the simple model here of Jesus in verse 35. He set aside a time and he set aside a place. Now, when you look at Scripture and you read something like this passage, you have to ask the question, is this descriptive or prescriptive? Is Scripture just telling us about something that happened, or is Scripture prescribing an action for us? Well, even though this is descriptive, I think it is a great prescription. It was in the morning at the start of the day, and it was in a deserted place, a place of solitude where he could be completely focused. Number three, be accountable. You know, the early African converts were um, very serious about their time with the Lord. And missionaries that worked with them would say that outside of their village, in the thicket surrounding their village, they would each have their own personal spot in that thicket where they would go and pour out their heart to the Lord. And over time, you could see little paths or little trails worn in the thicket to each of the spots where those early converts would pray. And what that meant was if there was a believer in their village that began to neglect prayer, it became very apparent to the other believers. And what they would say to the one who is negligent very simply is, brother, grass grows on your path. You know, we need accountability. It's not only that we're making a commitment to the Lord, but we're also making the commitment to a friend or accountability partner, someone who will say to us, because we've given them option and opportunity to look into our lives and ask this question, someone who will say to us, hey, brother, there's grass growing on your path. You're neglecting your relationship with the Lord. Principle number four, pray first. Before any decision, before any work, before any distraction, pray first. Andrew Bonar, the, the Scottish missionary of the 19th century, had three rules of life. Number one, don't speak to any man before speaking to Jesus. Number two, don't do anything with your hands until you have first been on your knees. Number three, this is going to hurt some of you, don't read the papers until you have first read your Bible. Pray first. Before anything, and this is another good reason, the morning is a great time, before anything comes your way that day, any problem, any distraction, any temptation, any decision, pray first. Number five, connect your prayer time with Scripture. And if you're reading through the New Testament, this is pretty simple at this point, you want to spend time in the Word and let Scripture show you how to pray and what to pray and to assist you in your prayer. As you read through each week, a chapter each week, you will find plenty in there to pray about and to pray for, and it'll help you connect Scripture to your prayer. And if you also pray Scripture, it's good to learn Scripture so that you can pray it. Someone has said that praying Scripture is talking to the king in the king's language. So connect your, your prayer with Scripture. Number six, keep a prayer journal. And that's to record both prayers and answers. There's a couple of good reasons for that. 
And you can do it. You notice there's prayer pages in the uh, New Testament journals. I've got mine on my computer because it's just a long running list that I keep adding to and going back. And, but the reason you want to keep a prayer journal is two things. Number one, success breeds success. If you can look at your journal and see where you have prayed and see where you have seen God move, that encourages you and motivates you to pray more. Then the second thing, the second good reason to keep a prayer journal is there are going to be times when your prayer life is dry, when it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, when it feels like that God has forgotten you. In Psalm 77, David was, was expressing his lament. He said, it seems like the right hand of the Most High has changed. It seems like God has forgotten me. I cry out to God all through the night. He doesn't hear me. And he goes on and on for 10 verses in this lament that God is far from him and distant from him. And then in verse 11, he says this, I will remember the deeds of the Lord, the wonders of long ago. You know what he's saying? Wait a minute. I may be in a bad moment in my life right now, but I know that God is faithful. I have seen God move, I've seen God work, I've seen God answer, and I know that he will continue to do that in my life. Now, how do we remember? Most of us, our remembers don't work too well. How do we remember? We remember by keeping a record and keeping a record of the prayers and the, uh, the answers we've seen. And then number seven, realize that prayer is warfare. It is hard work. Satan will do anything he can to keep you off your knees, or he'll do anything he can to keep you praying little crisis prayers or little brief prayers or little sporadic prayers. He doesn't want you to, to dig in and to dig deep. Samuel Chadwick said the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He doesn't fear our prayerless work, our prayerless study, or our prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray.